Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Protected urea, we know, is a technology that has we've heard a lot about in the last number of years. It offers many benefits, particularly in relation to reduced greenhouse gas emissions and ammonia emissions. And currently, it's estimated that 5% of nitrogen used in this country is in the form of protected urea. So there's significant scope to increase uh, this share and to talk more about this. Uh, I'm joined by Dr. F uh, Patrick Forrestal, who's a research officer in uh, soil science agronomy based in Chagask, Johnstown Castle. And Patrick, you're going to give us an update on the latest research uh, on uh, protected urea. Good morning to you. Um, good morning, uh, Mark. So um, Patrick, uh, and we have another Patrick as well joining us, uh, Pat Murphy. Uh, uh, most of you know Pat is our Head of uh, Environment Knowledge Transfer Program, also based down in Johnstown Castle. Good morning to you, Pat. Good morning. So Patrick, I know you have a, a, a comprehensive presentation for us, um, but before we go into that, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing down in Johnstown Castle. Mark and uh, well, welcome everyone this morning. It's uh, great, great to have you all on board here this morning. And um, so this morning's presentation will focus on protected urea. But of course, at Johnstown Castle, we're looking and across the organization, we're looking for a whole range of solutions to help us meet the challenges that we know that are coming over the next decade to allow us to continue to produce and to meet those environmental um, targets in terms of reduced emissions and improving water quality that are there. And you know there, there are many avenues that are being explored, but I suppose protected urea is a particularly heavy hitting option that we have on the table at the moment. And that will be the focus of um, this morning's presentation. And this is not of course to say that we aren't in my own program and across the organization exploring other options uh, and technologies, a pipeline of technologies for the future. Great. Okay. Well, look, uh, maybe Patrick, while you're you're setting up your your screen there, just to remind everybody that if you do have a question or comment uh, for Patrick, uh, or indeed the the, the team here, um, we'd be more than delighted to 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 put those questions or discuss those at the end of the presentation. So please use the Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen if you want to uh, send through those questions. And uh, Patrick, I'm going to hand over to you, and uh, sure, we will talk to you in a little while. Perfect. So thanks everyone for uh, for tuning in. And so as I was saying, we'll talk about protected urea and I'll give a research update uh, today. Um, I have a little bit longer for this uh, presentation, so we um, have a chance to go into a little bit of depth, see what's been done, and also there'll be some updates on uh, some, some new research from the yield perspective, uh, from the screening for potential for residues and uh, soil microbiology work uh, that's going on. Um, from myself and from uh, colleagues across the organization. Um, and I want to acknowledge at the outset uh, funding support from the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. And also uh, there was a number of Chagas Walsh uh, fellows um, who conducted their PhDs and are currently working on their PhDs on these topics. And all this work has come together uh, to, I suppose, inform us on this topic. So just by way of overview, we'll talk about uh, what is protected urea as it's become commonly known here in Ireland um, and some history and background uh, to this. And um, we'll talk about the greenhouse gas emissions picture, ammonia, yield, uh, touching on nitrogen use efficiency as well, which of course is going to become much more important over the coming decade, you know, with potentially uh, nitrogen availability being constrained somewhat. Um, also, I'll give an update on some of the preliminary work uh, coming from the soil microbiology um, aspects that are going on and the residue screening work. So to jump straight into it, uh, what is protected urea? So, you know, for some of you, you've heard a lot about it, but others may uh, know less. So um, essentially what's become commonly known in Ireland as protected urea is urea made safe from ammonia gas loss by the incorporation of something called a urease inhibitor onto the surface of the urea fertilizer granule or in the melt of that granule. There are three um, registered urease inhibitors under the EC fertilizer regulations. Those are NBPT, um, a mixture of NBPT 
and NPPT, a closely related compound, and also 2-NPT. And these compounds um, can be added to urea fertilizer to improve its characteristics in terms of what we know is the weakness of urea, which is loss of ammonia gas. And this loss of ammonia gas occurs when urea is spread on the land, it um, attracts moisture, and through the action of the urease enzyme, this hydrolysis or conversion over to ammonium, which is half of what's in a bag of can, occurs. And it's during this um, process that we can have some of that nitrogen loss as ammonia gas. And essentially, this urease inhibitor um, is reducing this loss. So you might say, is this technology new? You know, for many of us, we may have only heard about it in, in, in recent years, and there's been a lot of emphasis on it. Is this something very new? Well, uh, Catherine Watson, who worked uh, in Northern Ireland, here's a paper uh, from Catherine published in 1990. So that's 30 years ago or so, um, looking at the effectiveness of um, the urease inhibitor, NBPT, for improving the efficiency of urea in ryegrass production. And what did Catherine report way back then, 30 years ago? Well, in summary here, that uh, NBPT was able to reduce the ammonia loss from urea effectively. Um, and for a summer application, it allowed urea with NBPT to perform as well as calcium ammonium nitrate. Um, and have a, the same level of nitrogen recovery. So 30 years ago, there, we knew that there was potential with this. So NBPT as a compound, um, let's talk a little bit more about it. Um, I think this is worthwhile. And um, sometimes uh, new compounds, people can wonder a little bit about what, what they are. So thanks to this uh, gentleman here, um, Professor Rick Ingle, who's recently retired from Montana State University. We know quite a bit. He's um, done some nice work looking at that compound and its degradation. And I suppose given the conditions that we have in the country at the moment where uh, we have snowfall, Rick also did a lot of work showing that there can be quite high loss of ammonia uh, from urea spread in cold conditions, um, in snow conditions and so on. So that's, I suppose, quite relevant to, to us this week where you know, people might be thinking about um, that there, there might be safe um, in terms of loss just because it's cold. Well, that's not necessarily so with standard urea. And so in Rick's uh, 2015 paper, he um, uh, provides a schematic of the structure of NBPT. And you can see that it's a compound that uh, contains uh, carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen, um, and sulfur bonds. And NBPT is what's on the fertilizer in the bag. Um, and that, when it's spread, um, drops its uh, and hydrolyzes, it drops its uh, sulfur bond and picks up an oxygen to produce the oxygen analog of NBPT. And it's this oxygen analog, NBPTO, which essentially mimics urea in the field. So when the urease enzyme comes along, it thinks it's got urea, but what it's actually got is the urease inhibitor, which blocks that active site of the enzyme. And of course, the bacteria will continue to produce more enzyme, which will in time um, overwhelm it. But, um, and one of the questions that has come up, I suppose, has been around, you know, what's the potential for uh, NBPT to be there in the environment or to transfer? And I'll give you an update um, on the a screening study, but just to understand a little bit um, of background around its degradation. So in this 2015 paper, um, Rick Ingle looked at the degradation of NBPT uh, over time um, at different uh, pHs. But in this example of soil 2, he, soil, soil two, he had a pH of uh, 6.1. And you can see here on the horizontal axis is time and on the vertical axis is NBPT uh, recovered. And you can see that that degradation over time was quite rapid. So there was sterilized and non-sterilized soil. So typically in, in the field, we'd be dealing with um, non-sterilized soil. So you see a rapid degradation in that NBPT over time, such that it's down to very low levels by you know, day two to day four. But NBPT, um, as I've told you, hydrolyzes to its oxygen analog, NBPTO. Um, 
And note that there is quite a scaling difference here. And this just goes up to 20%. Um, but again, you can see that there's very low recovery in the soil of this NDPTO. So it's on the granule, it's doing that inhibition, and it's uh, degrading quite rapidly is what we can see from, from this published work. OK, so that's a little bit on the background. So let's ju jump uh, straight into, I suppose, the very extensive work that's been done here in Ireland over the last number of years, which was prompted by the fact that we needed to find solutions for um, reducing emissions um, and fertilizer nitrogen as a source of emissions. So as part of this work, which was again funded by the Department of Ag, um, we looked at nitrous oxide emissions and that work is, is published and it's there, I suppose, as an evidence base um, to inform, um, for instance, the inventory of, of emissions calculations. And this is Mary Harty uh, collecting one of you know, some uh, more than 80,000 samples that were collected um, to measure emissions in this work. And I'll just take uh, from that paper uh, one example here. These uh, triangles indicate calcium ammonium nitrate emissions uh, after application. And you can see these spikes in emission associated with application of a nitrate containing fertilizer. Whereas the urea based fertilizers, including urea NBPT, commonly known as protected urea, uh, were much lower. So there was a, a huge amount of measurement went on here. And when we boil this down uh, to what was the effect on the overall emission factor from fertilizers, and this is something that's been taken on by the EPA so they can, they can actually quantify uh, that at a, at a national level. The emissions of the greenhouse gas nitrous oxide um, were higher for calcium ammonium nitrate compared to the urea-based fertilizers. So about a 71% reduction here in the overall, overall emission for urea and VPT. So this is a very large reduction and you can't easily achieve this type of reduction. So reducing the nitrogen rate as seems to be flagged for the coming decade uh, will help. But um, to achieve this level of reduction, you'd have to have a, a very large um, drop in, in the nitrogen usage. And so we, need, we do need a certain level of nitrogen uh, to keep our systems uh, going and productive. And of course that drives that capture of carbon through the photosynthesis and the produ production of a carbohydrate um, or grass, which uh, feeds our animals. So because this work has been done, um, this provides the evidence to include this in the, um, in the Chagas Greenhouse Gas Mac. And you can see that their fertilizer type or the adoption of protected urea is a pretty heavy, heavy hitter in terms of the options that we have there and um, to reduce emissions. It's up there uh, with uh, dairy EBI. On the ammonia loss uh, side of things, again, we know what the emissions are here in the Irish conditions because we've measured that and we've also published that work. Um, and uh, again, that was funded by the Department of Ag Agriculture, Food and the Marine um, in uh, work in, in two projects um, that funding was secured by Carl Richards and Gary Lanigan at the time and we published that, that work. Um, and I've taken one of the temporal flows from these uh, wind tunnels where we measured the emissions. And here you can see for a March 10th application, uh, these uh, treatments had no NBPT included or urea based. Um, and you can see quite high levels of loss in March. So just because it's the spring and early on, um, if the weather conditions have uh, low levels of rainfall, even with low temperatures, you can still have high loss. So it can play a role. And um, in comparison with NBPT or indeed the CAN, those uh, ammonia emissions were much lower. So boiling this all down to, I suppose, what the national inventory sees, which is tons of these different products used and uh, these emission factors applied. So versus urea, urea NBPT has much uh, lower emissions as, as a similar level to CAN. Slightly higher, but very similar. And because we have this evidence, um, it's um, again baked into the Chagas Ammonia Mac, which was recently uh, published. And protected urea again uh, makes up a significant portion of the um, of the option that we have there for reducing ammonia emissions. And along with low emission spreading, it's really those two that we have as options to do the heavy lifting to come down and get below our ceiling, which we actually um, exceeded. Um, 
So this issue is right on top of us. So we can see in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, the type of fertilizer that we choose makes uh, an important difference with protected urea having lower greenhouse gas um, emissions and ammonia emissions uh, relative to the other two, which are, both have their strengths and weaknesses. Um, however, of course, for a farmer, it's going to be, and for our productive capacity, it's really important that any fertilizer we use uh, performs and, and, and provides the yield um, at a farm level. And actually quite a lot of work has been done in this area and is, is ongoing. So I'm going to take you through that um, so that I suppose you can have uh, a little bit more confidence or, around that topic. So we initially did uh, cutting trials um, that again are, are published and um, which showed similar levels of performance. But in addition, um, Chagas Swat Scholar uh, Anya Murray currently uh, with Brian McCarty has uh, grazing trials ongoing um, where the cow is in the mix. And in addition, we have uh, long-term uh, plots at Johnstone Castle where the fertilizer has been repeatedly applied to the same plots and we can look at what the effects are there. So that's kind of, um, so there's some, some new stuff here uh, to take you through. So I suppose in that original larger body of work that we did back in 2013 and 14, in those cutting trials, um, there, there were um, three sites uh, over two years. But when you take all of the replicate comparisons and all of the timings into account, um, this work is published there. This graph here summarizes behind it are 750 uh, comparisons of these three fertilizers. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of individual applications and timings behind uh, this graph here, which uh, shows us that in those uh, trials, uh, all of the fertilizers uh, performed the same. There was no significant fertilizer effect, um, and the p-value on that uh, was uh, 0.9, so 9%. So it fell short of the 5% level that we might take to, which we would take to show that there was a significant difference. So essentially, those fertilizers were able to perform at a similar level. So this is good because we know that they uh, perform differently for their emissions, so it gives us options. But you know, questions um, arose. You know, what about under grazing uh, conditions? Is it is it going to hold up? And I suppose that's why this important work is going on with the uh, uh, grazing trials, which um, are being done in Clonakilty, Moor Park, Valley Hayes, and Athen Rye, um, and that work is uh, ongoing. Um, the two fertilizer rates. Um, and three fertilizer types um, in grazing trials. And again, behind this, there are a lot of um, timing um, by replicate uh, comparisons behind uh, this work, you know, which we often have to, I suppose, for these type of presentations, summarize into uh, short order. So I suppose behind this, Anya is doing a lot of work. Um, so a summary of, of, the, of this work, uh, for the last two years is shown here. Um, and we can see that the yield performance between the three different fertilizers, CAN, urea with NBVT, and urea, um, is very similar. So very similar levels of yield between of these. And indeed, when we look at the statistical analysis of this, um, you know, the, these are p-values of 55% and almost 80%. So these are not as statistically different. Um, and also, uh, this graph here um, summarizes the, um, the performance of these fertilizers across the growing season. Um, the first bar is um, for CAN, then you've got the urea NBPT, and then you've got the urea. And if you look across the season, you know, the yield goes up and down uh, through the season, and you'll often see that there can be times of the year when um, you know, for where, where the yields are, are back a little bit or the growing conditions are not, not there. But generally speaking, the, the yield performance similar between the fertilizers. And so the summary um, which Brian put together from um, this was that there was no significant effect of uh, fertilizer type on herbage production, um, no effect of fertilizer rate on herbage production. And they didn't run into any practical issues with using a uh, protected urea um, out um, on, on, I suppose, the plot or farm level um, in com combination with the grazing. Um, and that study will uh, continue for another year. 
So I suppose this gives us another layer of confidence around its um, ability to deliver yield for a farmer. Patrick, we have a, a question here in relation to the impact uh, that maybe there are the effects that soil type and soil moisture have on uh, N2O loss. Could you perhaps comment on that? Yeah, so th this is a very important uh, driving factor uh, for uh, N2O loss. Um, and we saw that in the research that we did uh, for the tillage soils, they had lower emissions relative to um, lower emissions relative to the grassland soils because they tend uh, to, to be drier. Um, but yes, this makes a difference. Um, I suppose the, the thing is that sometimes it's hard to, so for the grassland soils, they also you know, have high levels of labile carbon, which is another factor which drives um, that denitrification process and the loss of the greenhouse gas nitrous oxide. Um, so when conditions are drier, um, yes, you can have lower loss and when conditions are wetter, you can have higher losses. The issue is in our climate is that it's a, it's rather difficult to, to predict when that's going to occur. And um, you know, as many of you that are farming can know often at various times of the year, you can have conditions that get wet. And the issue that we have is that I suppose when you put nitrate into the system, um, it's sitting there either to be taken up by the plant or if you get those wet conditions, the system is primed for loss um, through denitrification. And I suppose at a national inventory level, um, it's tons of fertilizer plus the emission factor, and that's that's how the how the national emission is calculated, and um, how we would get credit um, around uh, reducing it. So hopefully that addressed that point. Um, yeah. No, thanks for that. Um, so to to continue on the on the theme of yield assessment, and I suppose to give you confidence in how how these fertilizers perform. And one of the things that comes up regularly with farmers is that, well, sure, urea was yielding as well as everything else. Uh, shouldn't we be getting some benefit from purchasing those more expensive fertilizers, such as urea with NBPT to do the protection or, or indeed can? Um, and uh, in those single first year trials, single year trials, we, we didn't see a significant difference. Um, but at Johnson Castle, um, I have in place these longer term plots, um, which you can see here uh, to the right of your screen. And these plots are receiving different fertilizers, all of their nitrogen in that source uh, continually uh, since 2014. And we're just going to share with you some um, of the, I suppose, results uh, from that, just a, a preliminary summary of them. And hopefully in time we'll publish this also. Um, so here's the yield for the urea plots uh, over time from 2014 to 2019. And I suppose probably what jumps up out there um, is that um, 2018, we see that um, much declined, uh, declined uh, a, a big decline in yield, um, which is uh, attributable to the drought conditions. So we grew less grass in that year. And unfortunately, it was also a year when we used uh, more nitrogen fertilizer than other years. Um, And if we look at the control plots here, we see them yield their yield declining uh, after that first year. So the system's getting a bit tighter for, for nitrogen. So how did the urea and BPT do versus urea uh, over the longer term? So while there was no difference in that first year, um, if we look at the trend here uh, into the second year and over the ensuing three years before the drought, we do see um, at least a trend that there's uh, some evidence of a gap in yield uh, opening up between them. Um, during the drought year, it didn't really matter what you applied, the yield wasn't there. Uh, water was the limiting factor, not nitrogen. Um, and, um, and what about can? Um, again, this is um, somewhere intermediary. Um, and again, in that first year, we didn't detect a difference. But I think this gives some insight. Uh, so this uh, longer term trial shows us a number of things. Um, it shows us that the single year trial well, didn't detect a difference. Uh, that longer term trend um, is picking up some evidence of improved yields with um, NBPT over uh, urea. And certainly over the longer term, um, you could expect that urea NBPT should be able to perform at least as well as calcium ammonium nitrate. So this longer term trial um, also gives us potential to answer some of the questions that are now coming in, which are, what about, you know, what are the effects on soil biology over the longer term? Um, 
And you know, back in 2014, I suppose I was thinking ahead to what sort of um, you know, what kind of questions might we get over the longer term? And we're fortunate to have this um, in place. And I want to give John Murphy credit uh, for keeping it uh, running over the last number of years, uh, which has been you know, a considerable amount of work. But it's now allowed us to look at things like impact of soil biology due to the repeated application of um, this uh, fertilizer. So this is just a, a short summary of work um, done by um, Fiona Duff and uh, Fiona Brennan, who's our soil microbiologist, um, looking at this longer term effect using, using these plots. And so we're fortunate to have their expertise at Johnstone Castle and these plots to utilize. And so we have a number of different fertilizers and ag climatize does um, leave the potential open for you know, more, better, let's say, or, or improved um, fertilizers versus the conventional to be included there. So we have others, including nitrification inhibitors, um, but um, to look at um, the urea NVPT initially, um, we can look at um, a number of aspects of soil um, biology. And these are preliminary results, which will be written up and subject to interpretation by um, Aoife and uh, Fiona. But from an overall uh, type of view, we can look at urea versus urea NVPT. And in this uh, first graph here, looking at the populations, the total abundance of archaea, of bacteria, and of fungal communities, certainly these indications don't give cause uh, for alarm that these population total numbers are shifting uh, dramatically. Similarly, um, when we look at um, the nitrification and denitrification genes, um, similar effects across uh, across treatments. And uh, Fiona and Aoife are also look, able to look uh, more deeply into um, the bacterial population. So the total numbers are one thing, but what about who's there and the relative abundance? Um, and we can see here that for urea versus urea with urease inhibitor, you know, broadly speaking, these population numbers are uh, similar. So some preliminary conclusions from this work, which um, is in the process of being written up at the moment, um, similar composition and abundances across treatments, um, functional nitrogen cycling communities were similar between the fertilizers, similar functions um, across treatments. And there, there was uh, some evidence of in, um, or indications of impacts on nitrogen cycling with inhibitors. And we would expect this because this is really their function is to in interfere um, with nitrogen cycling, particularly um, in the case of um, the nitrification inhibitors. So I suppose something that's been keenly awaited and which I'll provide an update on now um, is um, this work that we've been doing, uh, again, funded by the Department of Agriculture and Marine under uh, the NVPT SAFE project, um, which was a, a testing of samples milk samples for potential to contain residues of NVPT or NVPTO, so those specific residues. Um, and I want to acknowledge and thank the team involved with this, um, um, both at um, Johnstown and Ashtown, to actually, uh, this work was done last year, which was kind of a challenging time in terms of lab closures and so on. Um, but I'll take you through now um, what um, was done. So as I showed you at the outset, NBPT and NBPT are not stable compounds. So they're very uh, susceptible to, uh, to, to, to degradation. Um, so they are, while they're stable um, in, the, in the bag um, on the fertilizer, and they have to be there at certain regulatory spec levels, which um, are checked by the Department of Agriculture. And um, when you put it out into the environment, um, into the soil environment, uh, mixing it with water, microbes, uh, they're not, sen they're not um, stable. So if we were going to detect this in milk, the first thing we needed was a very sensitive method uh, to detect it. And so that had to be developed uh, from scratch. Um, also, um, a method had to be developed to preserve the samples so that they didn't uh, potentially degrade from the time that they were taken to the time that they were analyzed. And so we went on to uh, bulk and individual uh, cow milk sample um, from the Johnstone Castle dairy. Uh, the samples were analyzed um, at the Ashtown uh, Food Research Center. 
So to give you a bit more detail on this, um, the bulk milk sampling was conducted um, from the overall uh, Johnstown Castle dairy herd. And that was sampled, the data that we have to report at this point was sampled uh, between February and September of 2020. Um, and the average nitrogen rate for the whole herd um, was 181 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And we did something uh, a little bit different to what a farmer would do here in that we applied all of the nitrogen on the farm as urea plus NBPT with a straight, straight nitrogen. In this way, maximizing the delivery of NBPT um, to the platform. So um, P and K was put on separately uh, using compounds. So typically for a farmer, um, urea with NBPT wouldn't be his only source of nitrogen, but that was the case here if you like to exaggerate the, the risk potential. Um, the samples were preserved and sent to um, Ashton for analysis. And the individual cow sampling uh, was conducted on a 20 cow herd, which had a higher uh, rate um, of 234 kilograms per hectare per year. Again, all um, as urea and BPT, and those samples were collected in June, July, and August, preserved um, for analysis and um, sent to Ashton. So to take you through a little bit of the um, a little bit of the, the detail on um, the detail on the actual uh, preservation of those samples, um, we're hearing a lot now about minus eighty freezers for preservation of vaccines. Well, a bit similarly, we um, collected the samples in these very small uh, four mil uh, vials. We also buffered the milk uh, to an alkaline pH, which stabilizes NBPT, um, and the samples were preserved at minus 80 degrees um, to keep them stable. And this is just an overview of how those samples were you know, then able to be, because of the small sample size, uh, could be um, thawed out quickly and gotten through um, analysis. And that method was developed with a very low um, limit of quantification of the method, which is at two parts per billion, which is an exceptionally uh, low uh, detection limit. And to summarize uh, the results, um, so um, almost 180 samples there from the bulk tank. Um, in terms of residue, uh, all those samples were below the limit of quantification of the method, which was two parts per billion. Um, in the, also in the case of the individual uh, cow samples, 240 of them, all below the limit of quantification, uh, two parts per billion. So what's the next step uh, for this work? So again, this is coming available. We're working on uh, the manuscript is being uh, prepared for peer review and for publication, and that will detail um, the development of that analytical method and um, its validation, and in addition, uh, summarize the results of, um, of that study. So I, ho I hope that during this presentation, I've, I suppose, given you some uh, deeper insight into the just the level of research that's uh, been done on this topic over the last number of years. Um, and we can see that um, protected urea or urea with a ureas inhibitor um, ticks a lot of boxes from, let's say, certainly from a farmer perspective in that it has lower greenhouse gas emissions than can, lower um, ammonia emissions um, than urea. And we can get credit for this at a national level. And it can um, help um, our industry in that we can show progress towards reducing emissions. And this is going to be really um, important um, over the next decade in terms of, uh, you know, I suppose what constraints uh, might come on agriculture to help uh, re reduce those emissions. Um, we've also seen in a number of different uh, trial contexts that it is reliable for yield. And in my opinion, that's, um, that's um, very solid. The preliminary indications from the soil microbiology work um, are positive. Um, we're not finding a residue issue. And as I mentioned at the outside, those emissions reductions are verifiable and agriculture uh, can get credit for them at a national level. So I suppose the key thing now is that we get uptake of those measures that are there on the, on the marginal abatement cost curve, um, and those include uh, protected urea. Mark mentioned at the outset that uptake is at about 5% of the 
total nitrogen uh, use last year. Um, so this is a, a very low level and there's a lot of scope uh, for um, unlocking that mitigation potential over the coming years. And Chagas is eager to uh, work with industry uh, partners and with farmers to ensure um, uptake of the identified mitigation measures at both pace and scale. And I suppose as part of that commitment, this new signpost uh, program has been set up and um, which is going to be head up, uh, headed up by, um, by Tom O'Dwyer. And so I suppose expect to hear more about that in the coming years. So I suppose as a farmer, you might be wondering, um, you know, what sort of options uh, do I have um, and how do I know that I'm getting, I suppose, something that, um, that has a urease inhibitor in it. So to help with this, um, on the Soil and Soil Fertility website, um, we have a list of the different fertilizers um, uh, protected form of nitrogen uh, there and Mark will keep that list, Mark Funker keeps that list uh, up to date. So I suppose there are 17 products there from six fertilizer companies. So there's a lot of potential options. Um, you know, if you can't get it in one place, well, there's, there are other suppliers. Um, and these contain these EC fertilizer regulation registered urease inhibitors, NBPT, NPPT, and 2NPT. And these have regulatory minimum and maximum levels, which need to be there at the point of sale. And the Department of Agriculture sample uh, randomly uh, to ensure that this is the case. So you have that, I suppose, that level of comfort that you might expect when you buy a fertilizer product that it contains the amount of nitrogen, for instance, that's marked on the bag. Um, and that's um, part of that role. So th there are options there with just nitrogen, with nitrogen plus sulfur, and with nitrogen plus potassium plus sulfur. Um, at present, there's no P containing options. But you know, the place I think, in my view, to start with this is in the straight nitrogen slots in your program. So in your fertilizer program, your straight nitrogen slots or your N plus S slots are a good place to start. And protected urea can be used in spring and throughout the uh, growing season. And um, so I suppose one fertilizer to set up your fertilizer spreader uh, for. And I mentioned that uh, Chagas is working on a whole range of, uh, I suppose, other potential um, avenues which may help us in the future. Um, including uh, the potential for nitrification inhibitors to be added to fertilizer and the role of other nutrients, the role of multi-species words of clover, um, et cetera. Um, and in my own program, uh, Claire Aspel um, is a Chagas Wall scholar who's working on uh, sulfur and in work um, that's coming out uh, from Claire, um, we're seeing that sulfur can uh, boost yields, it can increase nitrogen use efficiency, and importantly, it can have effects on reducing nitrogen leaching, and Claire has currently a paper in review um, on that uh, topic. So this is just a little summary where you can see that uh, for a range of soils here, um, a benefit of about 10% uh, to adding sulfur, and then another range of soils, your lighter soils giving um, much greater levels of um, improvement. So I suppose for, for the response to sulfur can differ quite dramatically um, across uh, soils in the country, but certainly there's evidence there that sulfur can do quite a bit to improve nitrogen use efficiency. And if you're a farmer thinking about your fertilizer program for next year, I'd encourage you to think about using protected urea and think about using the protected urea with sulfur and using a few <coughs> rounds of sulfur in your program um, there. So watch this space, I suppose, in terms of sulfur. Um, I'm going to leave the last, uh, the last word um, on this presentation, uh, which I suppose has gone to a, a deep uh, scientific uh, level, um, back out onto the, onto the farm. And uh, you know, we're, we're farming at home ourselves, but um, Aidan Lawless um, is the farm manager at um, Johnstown Castle at the dairy farm. And Aidan's probably one of the more, most experienced people in the country. Um, in using a protected urea. Um, he's been using it since 2016. It's now his main nitrogen source. And a few comments uh, from Aidan are that it spreads in the same way as normal urea. That's his practical experience over the last five seasons of, of using it. And of course, he was very familiar with spreading urea uh, prior to using protected urea. At a practical level, he's noticing this benefit that because it's more concentrated than can, there's less refilling time. 
So two bags of can is a thousand kilograms, covers about 10 hectares. He's blanket spreading the farm um, versus about 13 hectares for two bags of protected urea coming in at 750 kilograms. Um, and again, a comment from Aidan, slightly cheaper product. But, so we grow the same amount of grass. Um, it costs us less to grow versus can. Um, and we have lower greenhouse gas emissions. And I suppose in Aidan's words, in terms of meeting um, emission reductions, it's about the lowest hanging fruit I can think of. And I would agree with that statement. And I suppose at this point, um, I'll thank you for your attention and encourage you to use protected urea in the coming season. And I'll take any questions that, um, that there are. Thanks, Mark. Thanks very much, Patrick. Excellent, excellent overview. Uh, well, you, you, we, I suppose you took a deep dive there on a few occasions, uh, but nice to see you coming up for air at the end there and the, the, the practical uh, comments there from, from Aidan Lawless, who you say is a very experienced farm manager uh, down in Johnstown Castle. I think it's, 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 it's probably worth mentioning that uh, protected urea is part of a, a wider suite of measures uh, being uh, recommended by checks uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we've had some comments here about the use of clover and of course this 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 is a, a measure that that should be aimed to, to complement uh, the use of clover. Would that be fair to say Patrick? Yeah absolutely as I mentioned a number of times in the presentation you know uh, while this presentation is focused on protected urea but it's by no means the only thing we're doing it just happens to be that if you look at the marginal abatement cost curves, which uh, detail the mitigation potential that we have. This is a heavy hitter that's there at the moment for us. But certainly uh, clover is something that um, is going to also be very important. Um, but you know, with the clover swords, there'll be some nitrogen fertilizer used also. And um, so there's still a place for protected urea. So it's coming at this uh, using all of the tools that we have in the toolbox. There's no silver bullet for the challenges that lie ahead of us in the next 10 years. We got to use all the technologies we can get our hands on, um, and 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 take them up and put them out um, at farm level. You mentioned uh, Tom O'Dwyer just in your presentation there in relation to the signpost program, and um, just to let people know that we will be joined next week by Tom O'Dwyer, who's going to give us a presentation on the the plans for the signpost uh, farm program over the uh, which will be running over the next number of years. So. Um, a question here, uh, Patrick, from uh, Dr. Sebastian Lenz in Germany. So uh, we have viewers all over the, the world this morning. And he's really, I suppose his question is in relation to the impact of um, these uh, protected urea on the micro uh, organisms within the soil, but particularly in the context of soil organic carbon, his his his, his motivation is to, to try and maximize uh, soil organic carbon. And I suppose his, his, he's looking for some reassurance there that this, this isn't going to affect uh, the production of soil, soil uh, organic carbon. Yeah, well, um, I suppose Chagas has a research organization as well as an extension um, an education organization. Uh, we have a, a lot of collaborations with uh, different organizations across the world. We have this site at Johnstown Castle where We've had these repeated applications of the different fertilizers over time, um, and we can certainly uh, look at that. And that's one of the parameters that will be explored. But I'd certainly welcome Sebastian uh, to contact me if this is an area that he's interested in, because this resource that we have there at Johnson Castle, I would love, I'd be happy to be corrected and to learn about other long term studies that have <clears throat> at this uh, number of years of application. But this is a pretty uh, unique resource, and uh, we'd be happy to you know, work with others that are interested in maybe utilizing that to answer such questions. Okay, great. Um, lots and lots of questions coming through here. So, Pat, uh, you, you have a few questions ready? Yeah, for I suppose one which, which won't be described as one of the simple, quick questions, but I think it, it's a, a very comprehensive question which asks a, a lot. Uh, in order for NBPT to work and uh, react effectively on land, what are the restraining conditions in relation to soil pH, soil temperature, environmental humidity, and soil moisture in terms of the operation of NBPT? So that's kind of uh, when can you and when can't you, or when shouldn't you spread it? Yeah, well, I suppose that the, the simple answer is that you can use it across a whole range of soils and across the whole um, 
growing season. So that that's the simple answer. We we use it across the whole growing season, across all different type of conditions and across different soils. And to go a little bit deeper, um, I suppose to as an odd to the question, which you could probably spend an hour answering. Um, for for instance, um, the pH of the soil uh, does have an impact. Um, if the soil soils are very alkaline, it's been shown that NBPT degradation is a little bit slower, therefore it can have efficacy over a longer period of time. Um, typically our soils in Ireland are in the acidic range um, and it works well in these conditions. And these are the conditions that it was evaluated in. Um, but uh, I wouldn't see that there's a, uh, any uh, kind of obvious situations that you wouldn't be using it in. Okay. Um, a, a question here, have the rates of runoff been tested into groundwater or su uh, surrounded water bodies, or is there any other env wider environmental concern? Um, is that, uh, okay, so the, the question isn't, re isn't really specific, um, so um, it could relate to runoff of the nitrogen fertilizer that's been applied, or it could relate to the urease inhibitor itself. Um, so I'll address the nitrogen aspect from the first place. So because this is applied to a urea-based fertilizer, which converts to ammonium, which is positively charged, um, in comparison to a situation where you use a nitrate-containing fertilizer, which is negatively charged, um, there should be less potential for nitrogen leaching um, from, from the fertilizer, um, a nitrate form versus a urea or ammonium uh, form. Um, the second question is around the uh, leaching uh, potential for the, uh, let's say, or I'm assuming that there could be asking about the leaching potential of the urease inhibitor. Um, you know, I mean, the volume that it's used at um, is tiny in comparison to the volume of fertilizer that's used. And also, as I showed at the beginning, the degradation of that NBPT um, in soil as demonstrated by that paper published by Rick Ingle in 2015. So that degradation is extremely quick um, of NBPT and NBPTO. So I think the, the risk is, is low, um, but we haven't measured it directly as of yet. Patrick, we have a question here in relation to uh, the rate of inhibitor that was applied in the initial studies uh, on protected urea and in recent studies. And, and does this differ to, uh, from the commercially available products? Um, yeah, so and I, I think this is, this is a valid area, I think, for, for ex exploration. It's a valid area to, 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 to question um, and, and impor an important area. So for these uh, urease inhibitors, they all have a regulatory spec. Um, uh, going back to the, their registration as e under EC fertilizer regs, um, and Department of Agriculture checked that they have to have the minimum level uh, on them. Um, so um, the initial work uh, was done at a loading rate of, um, of 660 um, ppm um, of active ingredient. And the fertilizer products that are, are on the market uh, currently um, can, have, can have lower content and still be uh, within the regulatory spec. Um, let's say for, for a greenhouse gas uh, perspective, um, that's not going to make a great deal of difference um, because uh, you've got a urea-based nitrogen and it's really because you've got a urea-based nitrogen um, that you're getting that reduction in nitrous oxide emissions compared to a nitrate-based fertilizer. From a, an ammonia emission perspective, um, we chose that particular level um, of MBPT because that was what was shown in previous studies to give a near maximal uh, reduction of ammonia loss using MBPT. And there is um, some reduction as you go down in the rate of urease inhibitor, but not massive. It doesn't fall off a cliff. And again, Catherine Watson, who I mentioned at the very outset with her paper in 1990, has a nice uh, study which uh, shows that impact of uh, rate uh, versus uh, efficacy. And in New Zealand, where now about 35% of the nitrogen uh, that's used there um, is as a protect is as um, protected urea with urease inhibitor. Uh, they do use a lower um, NBPT uh, treatment level than is typically used uh, here in Ireland. 
Okay, thanks, Patrick. Hey, just a question for, in relation to, like, traditionally, urea, we would always recommend mm-hmm. not to be spreading it during, you know, dry weather, hot weather, because of the risk of volatilization and, and, and loss to environment. Uh, is is protected urea uh, a much safer product to use in in those environment and in, in those during those conditions? Yeah, I think this is a you know this is a, a good a good practical question. Um, this is what the protected urea is for. That's why you're paying for the protection over ordinary urea. Is that insurance that when you go out and spread, you don't have to be worrying about those conditions? And yes, that can happen in the summer. But that could happen in March as well when conditions are cool, but dry or, you know, you get that harsh weather. And, um, and I showed that in the presentation as well. In fact, one of the highest losses from urea that we measured was uh, for a March application. And um, that's what the protection is doing. It's basically bringing, bringing urea up to, um, up to the level of can. Maybe a few quick fire questions there. Um, have has an acceptable residue limit been established for for NBPT? And I suppose this harks back to I, I suppose uh, Sinead's talk last week, in which she talked about DCD in this context. Um, yeah, not 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 that I'm aware of, and I suppose this is uh, this can be an issue uh, with 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 compounds. Um, you know what, what's the what's the maximum residue uh, level. And I suppose when you get into the detail of, of, of residues, Martin Danner, uh, who's um, also working with me on that uh, project uh, for the screening of milk, this is more his area of expertise because uh, he's screening for residues of all sorts of different uh, things. Um, yeah, I mean, it would be good if for all compounds we had these type of um, maximum residue uh, levels, but Again, I'll point you to the results that we saw where we didn't find it. So if you don't find it, um, then... Uh, yeah, and, and there is toxicity work had been done on it as, as part of its re- initial registration years ago as well, I think. Um, yeah, there's a lot of, there, there's reams of information uh, available um, to be read if... if, if um, Very inclined. The qu- question, does a uh, protected urea product have a best before date? All right, I suppose the, 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 the question is, uh, how long does it last or how long does it remain effective? Yeah, th- this is an, another, I suppose, important uh, technical, technical question. Um, so we, we know that it, it, it can degrade during storage. That, that's correct. And um, in, the, in, in the studies that I, I demonstrated to you there um, and those published works, we got fertilizer at the start of the year, year and we applied it throughout that year and we were also measuring its emissions so that we, we could so we could see that it was doing the business throughout that growing season so what i would say as a rule of uh, thumb um, is that you know if you're getting fresh product at the beginning of the year and you're spreading it throughout that growing season you know there shouldn't be um, an issue with it um, on top of that, you have, uh, I suppose, that confidence that's there in terms of the Department of Agriculture um, as a regulator uh, checking that these products fall within their regulatory spec uh, for, for content. Um, you know, we've seen various stor- uh, storage studies which uh, can show um, that uh, the shelf life can extend you know, well, blo- well beyond uh, uh, 12 months. Um, worst case scenario, even if everything degrades, right? Even if you buy fertilizer this, you know, here in February and you have a bag or two left over at the end of the year, which you haven't used, you'll be spreading it next year um, in the early time of the year. Um, and the worst that's going to be is like ordinary urea. And this is very unlikely that um, it would have completely degraded at this time. Um, but, um, but I think it would be helpful to, to have, you know, some detail around when they're packed uh, on the bags just for the farmer. Yeah. A quick one. Uh, are the laboratory tests used in the studies uh, mentioned uh, re- reliable, validated, and accredited? Um, so if this is in relation to the residue testing, yes, it is. Um, yeah, so that that is currently being uh, written up. So that paper uh, yeah, is validated. So the method uh, also was put through a validation 
uh, test. So that paper will describe the development of that method and the, de the validation study to check that it actually was measuring what it was supposed to be measuring, as well as reporting uh, the findings of that screening study. So the answer is yes. Uh, can protected urea be spread with, uh, or, uh, soon after application of Lyme, or do you have to wait three months? <clears throat> so I suppose like anything new, um, there will be, um, you know, there'll be, you know, important questions such as this one, um, that I think need a bit more work. Um, so I, I think there's a little bit more work needs to be done on this. What I will say is I did run in the lab just a quick look see of protected urea put straight onto lime soil. And the indications are positive. But before, but since you know a national liming program and also widespread use of protected urea are uh, kind of flagged, I think um, that question deserves a bit more attention. And I think that's important why we should, it's also an important reason why we should take the knowledge that we have at the moment, which I, I suppose taken pains to describe that there was a lot of work went into it um, and take, take it for what it is. And that the, I suppose the limited resources focusing on answering, you know, these type of important questions. We know, Patrick, that there's a lot of um, a lot of nitrogen in this country sp spread as compound uh, fertilizer. What are the prospects of uh, us seeing a, a compound that includes protected urea? How compatible is it with other other uh, elements? Yeah, uh, so so this is a, a, a good question, and and the, the question around P comes up a lot. Um, so I think that, that there there is there is potential there, but let's take a step step back for a moment and look at where we are today right last year we were at about five percent of the total amount of nitrogen used as protected urea so there is a lot of opportunity to incorporate protected urea into the straight nitrogen or n plus s slots and um, where we know that the compatibility aspects are much more uh, sorted out so if you're a farmer that's spreading a straight nitrogen or a straight N plus S, you've got a potential to use a straight N or a straight N plus S uh, product. And for me, that's where we are at the moment is uh, to start there and, and, and work on that and, and let the compound aspect uh, be, be something for, for further down the road because we've got quite a journey to go on if we're going to unlock the mitigation potential that, that this has at present. And we're quite a ways from doing that. Just uh, the, the, sorry, Pat. Just a, the, there is a question here, which I think is an important. One. A lot of the discussion has been in relation to uh, uh, protected urea used on grassland. Uh, but ha has there been work done in in the use of protected urea in tillage crops? Um, yes, there, there there has. We we also did a body of work um, um, on on tillage crops, and I suppose it's important to distinguish that. Uh, what we're talking about is use of protected urea in, in grasslands. Um, in, in, the, in those drier um, arable soils, uh, which I did mention in the presentation, we didn't see a difference in terms of nitrous oxide emissions. So for the tillage soils, farmers can continue to use um, calcium ammonium nitrate, uh, nitrate type fertilizers from a greenhouse gas perspective. Protected urea is there as a potential fertilizer option because obviously they're going to, I suppose, use um, what what's available, but, um, but what may become an issue, um, depending on what way the policy goes, is access to urea, for instance. Uh, urea is, is there um, as an ammonia emitter uh, for us nationally, and um, so using protected urea in place of urea would reduce that national ammonia emission, but um, urea is probably a, a, a lesser source of nitrogen um, in the tillage setting, typically anyway. Question there uh, about any work in relation to improving the the the, carb, uh, the footprint of of calcium ammonium nitrate as opposed to switching to to, to urea. Um, yeah, I, I think that's that's a valid question. You know, what, what we need over the next decade, you know, it's flagged there. You know, I suppose in in agclimatized in the European Green Deal, you know, potentially reduced use of fertilizers, including nitrogen fertilizers. And that in, that in itself will help reduce the emissions associated with nitrogen fertilizer. And we're going to need to do more and more to 
hang on to the nitrogen everywhere that we can get it through low emission spreading by improving nitrogen use efficiency, liming, other nutrients, for example. Um, but um, I think it's, uh, um, just remind me of the question there again, sorry. I've, I've, no, it's, 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 uh, is there any prospect, I suppose, uh, that uh, um, a protection for CAN will come? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so um, I think this is, it's probably valid to explore this. Um, half of the half of the can um, has is in an ammonium source. Um, could a nitrification inhibitor uh, play a role there? Um, or the strategy times nitrification inhibitor. Um, but generally speaking, for the conventional fertilizers that we have, if they were going to deliver the solution, I guess we would already be there with the solution. What we need is nitro nitrogen fertilizers that are better than the conventional fertilizers. So, um, so I suppose that the challenge is there to, to see what, what can be done in, in, in that space in the pipeline of solutions over the coming years. But there's nothing yeah. imminent, Daniel, that's I think the point. Okay, uh, Patrick and uh, Pat, we're, we're a little over time, but I think it was important to, to address some of those key questions and lots more questions uh, here that just unfortunately we don't have time to get to. Um, so what we might do is we'll send you on a list of those questions coming through, Patrick, and if there's other, or any that we feel that maybe we haven't addressed, we might uh, take the opportunity to to, uh, to to do something in the future on, on, on protected urea because it is such... A, uh, an important uh, pillar of, of the, our, our agricultural response in Ireland to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So Patrick, thank you so much for a very, very comprehensive presentation. Uh, Patrick's presentation will be available on the Chagas website over the coming days, uh, as well as a recording of the webinar if you want to go back over uh, any of the details that Patrick went through today. So thanks again, Patrick and uh, Pat Murphy. Thank you for assisting with the questions. And also thank you to our production team, Andy Boland, Catherine Keena, Pat Murphy, and Yvonne Maher, uh, without uh, whom any of this, this wouldn't happen because uh, there's an awful lot of work that goes on in the background in terms of uh, getting ready for each of these sessions. So, um, so we, we do sh uh, share appreciation for the work that goes in. Uh, also, if you want to receive updates on training and uh, latest publications from Chagas, uh, we encourage you to sign up to Chagas Connected Digital. And uh, with what we might even do is talk to Mark Plunkett about that uh, list of uh, protected urea um, that is available and see if we can circulate that to our Connected Digital uh, uh, subscribers. Um, so look, without any further ado, thank you for watching and we look forward to next week. We'll be joined by uh, Tom O'Dwyer, who's the new head of the, the Chagas Signpost Farm Programme, uh, which is the Chagas campaign uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, climate and reducing greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So until next Friday, uh, thank you for watching and we will have a safe week and we'll talk to you next week. Thank you. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagas Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagas.ie. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.